Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Uh, hello and welcome uh, to our panel. I'm Pete Gould, the founder of Catapult Policy Strategies and co-host of the Mobility Podcast. Uh, first off, I want to thank Leslie, Eric, Eli, Macy, and the entire uh, team at the National Association of Regional Councils uh, for hosting this virtual conference. Uh, and most importantly, I want to thank everyone watching from uh, their couch or from their newly converted guest bedroom slash home office. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your day to come join us. Uh, and we've got a, a very exciting session and panelists today to, to dive into. Um, our session uh, is going to explore the, the question that's on a lot of folks' mind, which is what does mobility and transportation and transit look like going, you know, going forward uh, post-COVID-19 and, and stay-at-home orders and even beyond from there. So, you know, six months ago, the mobility space was already facing uh, a period of breathtaking change and in innovation uh, from TNCs to autonomous vehicles, dockless scooters and mopeds to flying taxis. You know, the ability to plan for the future has gotten increasingly difficult, um, while the options and opportunities for new approaches have, has also grown exponentially. So unfortunately, that was all before 2020 decided we didn't have enough on our plate and kind of has thrown everything at us as well, just to make everything even crazier. So uh, today's discussion is going to really help us to start to look at ways in which we can move forward, both in the post lockdown phase and then as we move forward. So our panelists today come from the tech transportation world, but from two, uh, I think, fascinating and different approaches. Um, Tara Lanigan is the Director of Business Development for May Mobility, a self-driving shuttle company based, in, a startup based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. As Director of Business Development, she's focused on helping cities and organizations find mobility solutions that work for their communities. She previously served as May Mobility's first customer service manager, leading city launches for most of the company's early AV pilots. Tara is an incoming master's candidate at the University of Michigan's Ford School of Public Policy and has worked at Detroit area startups since 2014. So welcome, Tara. Uh, our other panelist today is uh, Michael Schwartz, who is the head of customers and policy at Ride Report. Uh, he has more than a decade of experience implementing data-driven transportation plans, policies, and infrastructure. Before starting at Ride Report, Michael worked as a principal transportation planner at the San Francisco uh, County Transportation Authority. Uh, his work in the public, private, and non-private nonprofit advocacy programs uh, or sectors informs his wide-ranging perspective on how to successfully oversee micromobility programs to achieve public policy objectives. At Ride Report, Michael uh, supports city and regional agencies as they contemplate and implement micromobility programs serving as a consultant on data and policy while also helping staff effectively leverage Ride Report's uh, software tool. So thank you to both of you guys for, for joining us. Um, and to the audience, we're going to hear from both panelists first, and then we can jump to a few questions I had prepared for them. Uh, but what we really want to hear are questions from the audience. Uh, you can use the, here, I don't know if you can see it, but the, uh, the little questions box on the right here to type in questions. And so we'll kind of cue them and get to them, uh, and, and we hope to get to as many or all as uh, if possible. So uh, we look forward to it, and now I will kick it over to Tara. Great. Thanks, Pete. Um, and hi, everyone. As Pete mentioned, I'm the Director of Business Development at May Mobility. Um, hope everyone is staying safe and healthy and, and excited to be here today. So thanks for having me. I'm going to quickly share my screen here. All right. So I want to give some quick context on May Mobility before I talk about how our company is thinking about the future of mobility, um, along with our partners and, and other folks in the industry. So um, for those of you who don't know, uh, May Mobility is a self-driving startup based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And to give you a sense of our, our mission and vision, we are looking to transform cities through self-driving technology to create a greener and more accessible world. Um, and we do this by operating fleets of autonomous shuttles, running our own self-driving software. And so here you can see our autonomous shuttle, which is on the electric six-seater Polaris Gem platform. And we're a turnkey service. So we not only make the vehicles and the software, we provide the operations. We have a customer success team that helps our partners through the launch process. Um, we set up shop locally. We do the whole nine yards. 
And since we were founded in 2017 out of a robotics lab at the University of Michigan, we've launched four pilots in Detroit, Michigan, Columbus, Ohio, Providence, Rhode Island, and Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, and we have three more coming soon, including Arlington, Texas, which we're going to launch in or around March of 2021. Um, we're really excited to kick that off. It'll be our first demand response launch. Um, and we have a couple others coming up next year as well and, and looking forward to sharing those soon. Um, so that's just some quick context on May Mobility. And I will note that I'm, I'm always happy to chat about the launch process and what that looks like for a city, for a company, how it differs from city to city. Um, could go all, on all day about it, so don't hesitate to reach out if you're looking to learn more there. Um, but to switch gears here, I, I really want to talk about how we're looking at the future of mobility at May. Um, as I'm sure everyone here has, we've learned a lot in the last couple of months. Um, March and April were very, you know, day to day for us, not really knowing what was going to happen, how the pandemic was going to change things short term, long term. Um, but last month and this month, May and June, we were really able to dig into what we expect to see in the short and long term. And it really boils down to three themes for us. Um, and our partners, and that's clean, flexible, and creative. So I'll dig deeper into each of these and how they're really panning out for us and our customers. But to give kind of a high level overview, um, we really want to, to remind people of their resilience, provide something that works for them, um, and, and make sure that public transit does not, does not go away because of all of this. Um, and it's going to take us and others in the industry, other advocates to really drive that home with people and show them how we can keep it going. So, um, you know, clean, flexible, creative, these all drive towards keeping a shared option uh, that feels safe and addresses what cities and passengers need as that continues to ebb and flow as we've seen it doing for the last couple of months. So providers like ourselves will need to start working clean into our definition of safe um, we'll need to be more flexible as timelines, budgets, and priorities change, and we'll need to get more creative with metrics and other measures of success um, to, to make sure that we're preserving shared transit options. Um, I'll dig into how we're looking at a clean future of mobility with our shuttles specifically. Um, this is a, a little rendering of one of our shuttles and how we plan to upfit it for several new clean options. Um, and, and one of the themes that you'll see kind of in our approach for each of these themes is it's not just us working on this. We have customers who are helping us understand priorities and what they need um, and helping us connect to local industry and other partners that we can figure out how to get this done on the ground. Um, it's vendors who are stepping up with new products. It's cities who are informing us of how they're changing, even if they're not one of our current customers. Um, but to highlight some of this, in our, in our uh, shuttle as it stands, it's a six seater with two seats facing the front um, in, the, in the front row and then campfire seating in the back. This is obviously not anyone's first idea of what they want to ride in today, unless it's just them. So how do we keep moving forward with this option? we've come up with a few things here. One of them is partitions between the riders and the fleet attendant, our safety operator. So you'll see uh, in this rendering, there are partitions from the front seats and the back seats, and then also going down the middle of the campfire seating. So in theory, either, whether you're traveling alone or with one you know, family member or companion who you, you are you know, social distancing with, um, there is the opportunity to make people feel like they are in their own compartment. And it's not just with partitions, it's also with uh, UVC lights that will sanitize the vehicle between rides, um, going deeper than just someone with, you know, a disinfectant and a rag can go. And it's also uh, addressing airflow. So we'll have separate HVAC systems for each passenger compartment um, with added filters in the duct. We also are looking at other measures like a fogging system to decrease cleaning between rides. Um, and, and this is, is really just our first take at how do we make people feel safe, um, which is 
going, you know, another level deeper under safety with autonomous vehicles, we, we always need to make sure people are feeling safe. Um, but this, this is a really important addition to that. Um, and I will note that th this is not running today. We're working through this with our customers to make sure that this is what they want and need. Um, we'll likely launch these in the late summer, early fall, and uh, see how people respond. And then we'll, we'll go from there on improvements. The second point uh, that we're looking at, the future of mobility looks, looks flexible. So, you know, our goals are completely different uh, from 2019 to 2020. Um, our customers are pointing out very different priorities. Um, in 2019, one of the highest goals uh, was, was ridership and awareness. Um, our customers really wanted to see people coming out to ride this, to understand what was going to bring them out to try out AVs, to understand whether they can deploy these in the longer term. And, and May Mobility used that as a measure of success as well. Um, we hit over 250,000 rides um, earlier this year, and that was something we were very proud of. But quite honestly, in 2020, that's, that's not likely to be one of our, our most important goals. Um, with, with number of riders, um, you know, not necessarily safe if, as that goes up, um, we, we don't wanna highlight something that is, is not working for the industry anymore. And, and we'll need to, to be flexible in changing our goals, not just with ridership, but with what the research focus is for our partners, um, with what other metrics that they're looking at um, and how they want us to, um, to market to, to passengers. And then the third thing I mentioned was, you know, the future looks creative. So um, how can we adjust what our offering is to um, account for what passenger and, um, and customer priorities are? And one example is we've historically had six routes. I mentioned that our Arlington launch will be our first demand response option, but we are looking at other places where we can offer that um, because demand response allows for more passenger control. Um, they will be able to elect exactly where they get on and exactly where they get off without needing to have too much interaction. Um, they'll be able to go further and we can include other options outside of fixed routes that we previously offered. So if this is getting um, emergency workers to, to a hospital that was not previously on our fixed route, um, this is expanding the service area to the actual needs of the community. So we wanna make sure we're getting creative, um, go, looking past just flexibility and safety, but how can we really dig into what, what we can change about our offering to service what the community needs? Um, and other providers are going to need to do the same thing. So just to recap, um, we're looking at a, a clean, flexible, and creative future of mobility. We see this as, as short-term and long-term. So what can we do now as we're relaunching services, launching new services, um, and looking at the remainder of 2020? But we also expect that this will go much, much longer than that. We think that this will have an impact on people's um, priorities and, and perception of public transit and autonomous vehicle services for possibly years to come. So just continuing to iterate um, and, and talking through this with cities to understand what they need so we can keep changing it is, is what we're looking at. So thanks for, for listening and excited to hear some questions here and, and please don't hesitate to reach out. I'll make sure that my info is, is up, but here's my, my contact info. So thanks. I guess I will pass it back to Pete here. Perfect. Thank you, Tara. Uh, that was fascinating. And we're going to have a bunch of questions. Um, I think first, let's go and I'm going to let Michael go and then we'll start kind of doing questions for, for everybody. So now I'll pass it over to Michael Schwartz with uh, Ride Report. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Pete. And thanks, Tara. That was really interesting. Uh, I love hearing about these new innovations in autonomous shuttles and hearing how you respond is obviously uh, top of mind for so many people. Um, so as Pete said, my name is Michael Schwartz and I'm the head of customers and policy. Uh, and um, I just want to give a quick slide to just talk about what Ride Report is, because um, I'm guessing some of you may not be familiar with us. Uh, our 
um, our company. Our goal is to really empower cities and regions around the world uh, to support new clean forms of transportation, uh, fo focusing primarily on micromobility, aka shared e-scooters and e-bikes. And our primary product is a software platform um, that basically integrates real-time and historic micromobility data uh, to really help cities get a handle on their programs and do real-time data management. Um, I apologize, small issue here. Okay, um, so I'm gonna just really quickly go through um, a little bit about micromobility before COVID. Um, as many of you know, the phenomenon of shared micromobility is only a couple of years old, uh, starting in Santa Monica in late 2017. Um, but we, do, we did learn some things leading up to it. Uh, and then talk a little bit about what happened during COVID um, and then looking more towards the future. Uh, on a couple of these slides, you're going to see some references and um, some credits to people. That's because uh, we have been um, running a webinar series at Ride Report, and I'm going to shamelessly plug it. Uh, for those of you who really want to dive deep, uh, we cover everything from, from data to operations to what cities should be thinking about. Uh, and we feature a lot of different people, including some people from MPOs. Uh, so if you want to go there, um, you, you can afterwards, but I'm definitely going to be using some of the information because I've learned a ton from it. Uh, this all started right around the time that, that the shelter in place really started. All right, I'm clearly having technical difficulties here. All right, I'm going to try this again and hope that this works. Okay, um, so leading up to uh, COVID-19, again, starting in 2017, um, there was a lot of this sort of quick launches of operators, um, cities often reacting to the phenomenon. Um, it, was, it was this sort of new idea. There had, of course, been bike share for a while uh, with dock-based system. But this sort of new dockless mobility, particularly venture-backed private companies, was a new idea. And it became very crowded with operators very quickly. Um, and in general, there was a uh, mixed reaction. This comes from uh, really TNCs from sort of 2012, 2013. And I should say, when I was working at the San Francisco County Transportation Authority, uh, there really was this idea of the, the phenomenon happening to agencies as opposed to partnering with, with those agencies. Uh, and so I think that cities tended to be pretty reactionary. And so their focus was really on regulation. How do they really ensure that they're in control uh, and able to pass regulations that, that uh, ensures that they're able to manage and understand micromobility? Um, so this is just a very quick um, set of the number of players in micromobility. Um, you can see there's a lot of different things happening um, here. At, but if you just focus on the top of the map, uh, these are just the actual operators themselves, and you can see just how many there are uh, between scooters and mixed modes. And so you can see how it, it was very crowded and, and very challenging to kind of understand the space uh, and also made it very, uh, a lot of cities sort of oversaturated with the number of, of operators. Um, and as I mentioned, there was this kind of reaction, so a lot of focus, a lot of um, politics, a lot of news media focusing on um, scooter collisions, people not liking them. Um, and so it really kind of became this thing that uh, people were not sure whether they liked micromobility or not, particularly city agencies. Um, in addition, uh, we did start to see before um, COVID-19 some regional partnerships. So I know for the, for the COGS and the MPOs uh, on, on this presentation, uh, there was an interest in really getting this coordinated approach so that there was uh, the same uh, approach amongst its member cities around how it handled micromobility. Um, sometimes they were offering things like technical um, support and procurement uh, for cities that it might not be able to bring on um, a permitting structure or perhaps the tools that it might need to, to manage it. Um, there's also, of course, an interest in transportation demand management and connections to and from transportation, um, including uh, just starting the sort of conversations around how do you sort of incentivize trips that are making the, the right connections. Um, data sharing, obviously being a, a very important thing, particularly across jurisdictions. 
um, as well as uh, trying to understand um, how to make sure that when one city calculates a set of trips or key metrics, it's calculated them the same way as other cities as well as the region. Um, and finally, something like fee reconciliation. So maybe one city charges one fee, another city charges another fee for a trip. What about trips that cross those jurisdictional boundaries? How do you reconcile those? So they're really um, starting to emerge this idea of a role for regional governments. And I just wanted to highlight, we, we are working with the Atlanta Regional Commission as well as Dr. Cog in, in the Denver region. Um, and so we've started to started those conversations. And I think this really was an emerging trend um, just as COVID was starting to go. Um, the other thing here, um, this is a very, very busy slide and I apologize. And I of course um, also need to give credit to Jonathan Hopkins of Lyme who shared this in one of our webinars. Uh, but you can see that in terms of fees, uh, there really is a little bit of a dividing line where um, what gets subsidized and what gets fees um, could be a little bit backwards depending on, on goals. So um, transportation network companies such as Uber and Lyft um, often didn't have um, specific equity requirements. Sometimes there were fees um, just starting to come online um, and certainly cars did get, um, there's gas tax um, for the sort of pay as you go. Uh, but, but micromobility really did get very large upfront costs. Often they would be lump sum fees right at the start of programs. Um, and that really runs um, counter to what I think the ideal of what micromobility is trying to be, which is closer to a bicycle, uh, in terms of its sort of lower emissions, uh, really trying to use space more efficiently on the street. And so there was a little bit, again, with that reactionary um, idea of maybe micromobility is not something that the cities or agencies necessarily were trying to encourage, and they may have, um, their fees sort of reflected that nature. So we at Ride Report started talking about uh, something we refer to as micromobility winter. Um, and this is really the idea that as it became clear that the way micromobility was being permitted, the way it was being operated with so many operators in any given city, that it really wasn't gonna be sustainable. Uh, and we started to see this uh, happening earlier this year, where there seemed to be a recipe for uh, market consolidation. And you could see that some of the operators might not be able to make it um, and others were gonna, were gonna buy them. Um, and then we basically said, well, micromobility winter is now micromobility winter on steroids with COVID. Uh, now, it's at this really tough time. It's very clear that some of the operators would not be able um, to survive this. Um, and some cities also may not be able to have micromobility coming out of COVID, um, particularly those that aren't able to show um, sustainable unit economics. Uh, and you certainly saw some of this um, in recent weeks. Uh, many of you have probably read the announcement that uh, Lime received a huge offer of funding from Uber. Um, and they also spun off their jump uh, electric bike and scooter operations and let uh, Lime have it. So this is kind of a, a, a very large shot across the bow of what we think is, is going to be coming this year with a lot of consolidation and potentially um, some, some of the operators going out of business. So to give you a little bit of the current state here during COVID, um, many of you I, I'm guessing have been following some of the Apple data um, around driving directions. So you can see that um, driving and walking, I, I keep giving this slide in different presentations and it keeps kind of creeping back up. And you can see that it's now actually above the baseline of January. So um, this is basically taking and looking at driving starting in Jan early January. Um, you can see that now there's more driving directions being asked than before, um, and, as well as walking. Uh, the purple line really represents transit, which is obviously way down. Uh, and probably will stay down for, for quite some time. That's due to both uh, the amount of operations that agencies are gonna be able to sustain, um, as well as obviously just the current state, people are understandably a little uh, concerned about getting on, on a transit vehicle. Uh, if they haven't maybe taken all of the steps uh, that Tara was describing with, with May Mobility, there's a lot of um, concerns around sort of shared spaces like that. Um, in the midst of all this, of course, there's some signs um, of spring. Uh, we noticed that there's a lot more people uh, buying bikes. There's a huge wait list. This is on the, in the New York Times uh, saying that you have to, there's a very long wait list, um, as well as e-bikes being particularly popular. Um, so a, a company called Van Moof has also um, been able to scale up their operations and there's very large uh, waiting lists as well for those. Uh, so there is this sign that people are, are turning to these socially distanced forms of, of transportation. In terms of some of the shared micromobility trends that, that we've seen, uh, 
as you can imagine, February versus April, uh, there was just a huge drop uh, in uh, ridership. And, um, and let me fix this slide really quickly. Um, so I think it's missing. Yes, missing the, the metrics there. Um, but you can see both the vehicles for rent, um, total trips, and the trips per vehicle per day um, were all down you know, almost above 90% for most of those. And that's, that's pretty obvious. Um, in some cases, the operators were pulling the vehicles themselves. In other cases, um, the cities and regional agencies were saying that they didn't want uh, those, those operating. So it was basically a complete pause on micromobility operations uh, from February to, to April. Uh, and you can see that in the, in the chart here at the bottom. This is the number of vehicles out on the street each day. Uh, you can see as it kind of drops off a cliff there uh, right towards the end of March uh, and then has slowly started to rebound and build. And we are seeing uh, scooters start operating again. And we know that people are using them uh, a little bit and I'm gonna show you in a moment what this means, a little bit for recreation, um, but also as a way to start traveling around um, in a way that does provide some, some social distancing. Um, so we are seeing some change in the profile of the trips, those that are being used. So uh, this is looking from sort of mid-January to mid-March on the top pre-COVID-19. You can see the distribution of trips, a lot of short trips, that definitely makes sense. Um, and, and that's sort of those first mile, last mile or short downtown connection trips. Um, during COVID, there are still still those, sh still those short trips, uh, but you can see that bump over at the end of those trips greater than five miles. So you can see that people are starting to use them for longer trips. That's obviously an indication that some recreation um, is happening of just people looking um, for fun things to do uh, during coronavirus. There's not necessarily um, a lot of a lot of things like this to to do. We've also noticed that some of the operators are adapting. Uh, so some micromobility companies like Spin here on the left. Uh, provided free rides for first responders uh, and also cut fees uh, for people um, who were were operating uh, who need to, who were uh, essential workers during that time. Um, and then on the right, a, a New Zealand company, Flamingo, actually changed some of their business model and decided to um, do scooter food delivery. Um, again, this was when they started to open back up um, and allow food delivery. There was a time when there was, none of the restaurants were even doing takeout, um, but once they did, they, they changed. Uh, to that direction. Um, and then another example here is a company called Pony uh, in France. They're a electric bike share uh, company. And they basically went from the shared model that we know, which is sort of um, renting on an as needed basis to allowing the users to rent for um, the entire week or the month. Um, and they, they basically understood that people might not wanna share their bikes during this time. Um, and so they, they did that, implemented a lot of safety procedures, um, similar to what Tara uh, was describing, um, obviously a little different since, since it's outdoors. Um, and they, they found quite a bit of success uh, in doing that, that there was, a, like I mentioned on previous slides, a lot of demand for biking, um, if people could do it in a safe way. I think the other story that I'm sure many of you are familiar with on the call is really about the public agencies um, and their adaptation during this time. Uh, the, particular thing is slow street. So I think a lot of cities were experimenting and then Oakland kind of really upped the whole game uh, by opening up 74 miles of, of streets uh, with temporary materials, such as saw horses and signage to basically say, hey, we're gonna close down um, these streets to through traffic and, and open them up for people. Um, Seattle went ahead and said, actually, we really like this. We're gonna um, permanently close 20 miles of these streets. Uh, and then just a couple of weeks ago, uh, London said that they're going to, uh, they were one of the last countries to not allow e-scooters and they went ahead and legalized them. And then with that also did a two billion pound package uh, of infrastructure improvements to support all the increased uh, cycling and other micromobility. So really seeing a lot of city experimentation, how do they respond to, to the current times? So looking a little bit to the future, and I'm going to keep it uh, more in the in the near term future, just because I feel like the crystal ball is hard to see at this moment. Uh, beyond that, uh, so obviously uh, regions have these ambitious goals um, around all kinds of different things, such as congestion, climate change, um, and, and, and equity. And shared micromobility really is sh showing some promise as a way um, to be a tool for behavior change. We're seeing that a lot of the trips that scooters are replacing would have been taken by cars or in transportation network companies. Um, but we also know that it's very volatile right now uh, for these companies. This is um, the kind of things that, you know, the public sector, it's not 
something that happens. MPOs don't go in and out of business in the way startups do. And so that is something that's just important to keep in mind. Um, and so part of it, uh, keeping these phenomena going is understanding that some of them might fail and, and that being okay. Uh, and so obviously there's some implications around how much public funds to invest and how much staff time. Uh, but I do think that um, it's showing that there is, especially um, as we get beyond COVID, beyond these, these months, that there is the ability to potentially um, have micromobility be one of the new mobility modes that, that makes it. Um, so some other considerations for public agencies. I did want to just talk about data-driven management. So obviously this is, this is what Ride Report does. Um, it's really looking at trends and understanding over time um, how different uh, operators are acting. Are they obeying the rules? Are they staying out of the areas they're not supposed to be in? Um, and so what's really kind of one of the benefits of that is that this data-driven management can help avoid in-person or, or police involvement. And obviously it goes without saying at this moment in time, um, this is an important factor to, to think about how do we continue to manage programs, manage our transportation infrastructure in a way um, that minimizes police involvement um, until further uh, structural reforms are in place. Uh, because otherwise um, these new phenomenon are maybe only accessible to a subset of our of our citizens. Um, and the big uh, caveat to that with data is that there's a big privacy and anonymity uh, discussion around this data, and I'm not going to go deeply into it at the moment, uh, but we need to be careful about that uh, because you could replace uh, one inequity with a completely different one uh, depending on, um, depending on uh, how you handle that data. Um, obviously, before COVID, we were in a very different economic state, so we were talking a lot about uh, transportation and how it worked on our network, but less about things like um, how many jobs are these new micromobility companies bringing? Um, how many jobs do they have themselves? How many do they enable? Um, obviously, this is a, a new light. Uh, the other thing is we've had this sort of very reactionary mode to it, um, but we're starting to really see partnership models emerge where you're seeing cities uh, perhaps line up, particularly in terms of fees, of saying, hey, why don't we do something that's a partnership where the city takes a per trip fee so that when the operator is making money, the city is making money and it creates sort of a virtuous cycle of revenue where that money gets reinvested in things like protected bike lanes uh, that can really help the business and create more trips. Um, as, as I mentioned before with uh, COVID, before COVID there was a very strict caps was sort of the norm for cities where they would say, you can only have this many, only this many operators. Uh, we're starting to see a little change of that where the caps are really being more dynamic. So as long as the scooters are being used, there's no strict cap, but you just say, hey, your scooters need to, on average, be getting at least two trips per vehicle per day. We don't want them sitting around all week. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that micromobility may seem like this very small thing. Um, and I just described how you know we're, we're seeing it as a very strong potential to meet things, but it really is also should be thought of as a playbook for other new, new mobility modes. There's a lot of um, data sharing practices that are being codified here, a lot of sort of public-private partnership practices being codified. And so it should be really invested in not just for micromobility, but also beyond. Um, and then obviously a lot of uncertainty for the future. So how will commuter uh, behavior change? We'll have to see um, what happens. You know, we're saying post-COVID, um, but we really mean during COVID because we're not post COVID at this point. We're just post the beginning of COVID. Uh, which companies will recover? Um, what is the right approach of, of the public sector? Um, and then also just remembering that, of course, COVID is really just one piece, is, is just one kind of challenge. Uh, there are much bigger ones, or there, there, I shouldn't say bigger, there are other ones that are on the horizon. Obviously, we saw uh, events in the last couple of weeks show that there are other uh, imp important and uh, very timely things, but then things like climate change. So we have large goals uh, and we should remember to learn from the current crisis so that we can be more prepared for the next ones. So thank you very much. Uh, that concludes my presentation. You can see the URL up there at the top. Um, that will uh, send you to what we call our, our fireside chats, which is our webinar series. If you wanna learn more about micromobility, we had a, a bunch of great panelists. Um, and of course, my email address if you want to reach out and be in touch. So thank you very much for your time. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. That was, uh, and thank you, Tara, too. Uh, those were both great. And, and as you guys can see, there's a ton of, uh, of kind of different ways that technology is being applied to uh, transportation, both public and private, 
uh, as as offering new solutions for mobility. And then as we, uh, yeah, please, folks, if you want to come share, uh, we'll do a little Q&A now. Um, you know, and as we move forward, you know, I think a lot of folks are focused on how do we ensure that you know, there's going to be changes in how people get around? How do we ensure that it, we don't right now just see a lot of offloading from transit to single occupancy personally owned vehicles uh, and the kind of traffic and, uh, um, you know, environmental and every other catastrophe that comes with that uh, long term. And so, you know, I think one thing that's going to be really key and, and Tara, you touched on it uh, that you guys are facing is that it's not just a matter of, for, you know, for any shared ride, whether it's from a you know carpool up to a, a you know double double decker bus, um, it's not just how how do you ensure that you make that everything is clean and that you know it is wiped down. It's really a public perception of how do you convince the public that it's clean and that it's safe and that they should be riding transit. What what are you? How are you guys approaching it? And how, I guess to what extent is it going to be a trial and error uh, on public perception? Yeah, that's that's pretty much exactly how we're going to to approach it. It's definitely going to take teamwork from different industries and different players. Um, so whether it's you know just uh, making sure we're communicating CDC and ex and expert recommendations to marketing very clearly what the changes we've made in the vehicles are, um, asking for feedback, and then also leaning on our customers, partners other locals who are able to help us understand anything specific to the community. So we might not be marketing it the same in Detroit and Grand Rapids and Arlington. Um, we wanna make sure we're doing it in the way the community is looking for. Um, and then again, just huge feedback loop there. Um, and, and Michael put it well, this is a pretty long-term thing. This is just the beginning. Um, and that's why I, I kept the timeline pretty fluid there because we don't know what's going to fluctuate and when. Um, so just going in and out as we need um, for the next however many months or years. Yeah, I think at this point, the future is kind of Wednesday for everybody. So uh, yeah, so and Michael, you you got into some of the kind of recent bearish news in the micromobility industry. Um, you know, a lot of the largest companies who are, you know, have the biggest footprints, when you're forced to shut that down globally, that quickly becomes not an advantage, but a just a large number of fixed costs that you're still you're still paying. Um, you know, and, and we're seeing that. And so do you see, you know, we're talking about partnerships. Do you actually see where that trend gets to the point, much like the early, you know, private, uh, privately operated streetcars? were privately operated and then when that became less of a of a thing it suddenly it was we we really want this it's a good service and therefore the public sector steps in do you see that happening with micro mobility soon or over time yeah i mean it's it's a great it's a great question and i feel like uh covid has given cities and and regional agencies the ability to take a step back and think about where it fits into that context and obviously i had those slides before that you know, scooters are very different than TNCs um, or, you know, certain types of vehicles. And so I think they're able to see, you know what, this can really support certain things we want. Uh, in particular, we know that if everybody gets in their cars, as I, you know, I showed, I showed that driving chart, if everybody gets in their cars and no one takes um, shuttles and transit and scooters, our streets are, they just can't handle it. And so I have started to hear some discussions from streets, uh, from cities that were uh, had literally been saying, how do we extract the most benefit or the most fees to, to actually thinking, you know what, we might start subsidizing this because this is a need we have. Our transit service, uh, even at regular operations, because of social distancing, we don't have the capacity. So the same bus can only carry a quarter of the people. We need to get people downtown. Scooters, electric bikes, those are really a great way to get people where they need to go. And uh, if the unit economics may not work um, in the near term for these companies, maybe this is something we, we need to invest in. And again, I think I was really trying to think of it as that partnership. So what makes it work? Um, one that I will flag just because it's one of our, our partners. Uh, if you look at the, the Denver city, of, city and county of Denver, they have an RFQ out and they're really trying to dig into, hey, how do we make this work so that we can get the public benefits we want and at the same time, make sure that the operations are sustainable because we want these companies to be able to stay around. We don't want to sink them by ending up permitting with us. Uh, and so I, I encourage people to, to review that. I think that, that RFQ just, just closed recently. Nice. Okay. And then, Tara, you know, when we 
I guess looking past Wednesday and and even beyond, you know, the COVID uh, focused, you know, impacts. When we're looking at the future of transportation and autonomous vehicles, um, when we're discussing that, we often hear we're presented with this heaven or hell scenario, um, and in which hell means every one of us owns our own, you know, AV that drops us off. At, you know, we've all moved to you know hundreds of miles away, and we commute because we can sleep and do whatever. Uh, and then it drives around the city blocks instead of paying for parking and all of those things. And so I'm curious to hear, you know, May's approach to, you know, you guys have focused on shared AVs, you know, not a full bus at this point, but you're starting with, it's about shared rides. Can you talk to about the vision there and, wh and why that's important? Yeah, um, that's definitely something that has come up a lot in the last couple of months is how do we continue to keep that vision of shared mobility um, with with COVID kind of looming here. And and we are one of those startups that that Michael mentioned. Um, we're not uh, a government entity that that might survive this um, completely. So that said, we still currently have no intention of, of going with the robo taxi model. Um, if we want things to be accessible and environmental, um, taking shared rides out of the equation is is really not in the question for that. Um, so we're hoping that um, our kind of incremental approach and um, custom approach for each city with these clean shuttle options, with um, demand response, and just making things work in the shorter term, that will just bridge the gap from what's going on right now to whenever shared mobility comes back into full swing, which it will, we don't know how long it will be, but eventually most people will go back to the way things were with shared transit. Um, so in the meantime, we can work with these partners that we're working with now on what clean transportation looks like in shared mobility, um, and then work on the technology in the meantime as well. There's obviously leaps and bounds to be made and, and um, I think a lot of, of companies had to walk back where they were at. Um, and even though we're not, you know, Waymo with billions of dollars, we we have made a lot of traction for the size we are on the technology side. And this gives us the opportunity to go even further there in the coming years. Excellent. Yeah. And, and Michael, you, you touched on, uh, you know, obviously there's, there's a, a very, you know, long overdue and, and a lot of focus right now on the topic of, equity and safety and all that you know equitable service uh has been a big focus uh, from in the from a regulatory uh, standpoint and from a a, a a operations in the micro mobility industry you know starting from cities this saying not only does this have to be available everywhere but uh, you know setting aside a percentage of the fleet that can be deployed must be you know uh located and deployed every day within you know typically they're called equity emphasis areas or such you know where you have uh low income high unemployment uh and, and typically not, not great access to transit um what are you seeing like what is the data that you guys are seeing when you're collecting how is that showing the effectiveness like what is the the adoption uh in in equity emphasis areas uh and what are there any kind of new use cases or you know insights that like wow like when you give when you give people uh, the ability to move freely and, and whatever they're doing things that we never had been th thought of before yeah uh, great so great question and i i feel like you know my experience in the in the bay area working in san francisco you know i think a regional bike share system had been in the works for something like you know seven or eight years uh, by the time scooters dropped. No, I should say really more like 10 years. Um, and at that point, there were really only 500 bicycles in the entire region. Um, and so it turns out that if you get the bikes into neighborhoods, people use them. And so that's like one of the very first barriers. And I think it's one of the huge advantages of this uh, private operator focus is that they can scale so quickly. And especially because the focus really was on scaling. So um, all of a sudden, just having scooters and bikes available in neighborhoods that traditionally had not had them, guess what? They started getting used. Um, however, it wasn't clear who the people were. And I've definitely seen some data showing that even in those neighborhoods, um, it tended to be not necessarily low income communities, people of color, uh, who may be the target of what you're saying when you're talking about an equitable distribution. So beyond geography, how do you let lower income people have access to the system? Uh, we did see operators try some pretty interesting things, in, including a lot of cities would require the ability to pay by cash, um, low income fares, so reducing the cost um, of the trip 
uh, I found th those have found to be moderately successful, uh, right? I should say modestly successful. I think marketing them, making sure people understand them. Anyone who's worked in bike share for a long time uh, may know that you can't just kind of set up a program and think that people are going to come adopt them. Um, you really need to do deep outreach into those communities. So it's almost like the opposite statement of what I just said, um, in that you really need to uh, really target deeply if you want to reach communities um, of, of who have not traditionally used these services. Um, and then uh, sort of the, the final piece is really around um, the cost of this. So that's really a public good when you're talking about making sure there's an equitable distribution. If you were just to let the free market do it, they would probably just go to the profitable areas, maybe close to downtowns, maybe tourist areas, not reaching that public good of getting access across the city. Um, so the cities have this great leverage point to say, well, if you wanna operate here, we need you to distribute to these areas. Um, however, there's a growing recognition that that really is hitting those companies' bottom line, and you need to at least uh, make up for it. Maybe it's, uh, I mentioned sort of the idea of a subsidy, but maybe it's through an increased cap in the areas that are profitable. But just some acknowledgement that this is a public-private partnership and that if you just sort of say, well, you have to meet all these hoops um, here, but we're not going to let you actually have sustainable profitability, that's going to lead to a system that's going to have turnover um, and likely uh, people not, not staying in operation. So I think the idea of equity as a public-private partnership um, is really something that each uh, can, can work better as a whole than any one entity could do on their own. Fascinating. I like that. Um, and then, Tara, one, you know, one thing when you think about uh, autonomous vehicles or self-driving vehicles, um, you know, one question that always comes up is, is jobs and, and what that impact is. You know, when you're working on, you know, whether you're partnering with cities or with trans agencies, you know, there's going to be questions of, is this about a job elimination? Can you talk about kind of how the like the the what you know what that means in terms of these vehicles when you are doing them in a public transit setting and also what that means whether it's are there are these jobs that go away or is this there's now a new role for the individual that's you know from the agency yeah so that's that's definitely a good question and something we've been looking at um with this new bill but there so there are definitely a lot of different roles that that this new um, system would provide. So it's not only our safety operators, which will likely need to last for at least a few more years, um, maybe not in every scenario, but in, in most scenarios, um, as well as technicians, local management staff. Um, there's also, you know, we're currently a turnkey service. There are so many options for us to just partner with transit agencies in the future instead of providing that service ourselves. Uh, in the Right now, it's for us to learn so that we can walk new partners through all of it but eventually it won't make sense for us to own that entire process when transit agencies have have the expertise there um, so there's that there's also remote customer service representative opportunities i think we'll see a lot more opportunities show up as well um, and just making sure to keep in contact with transit agencies and others um, over the years as this develops and making sure they're they're part of the conversation of what those roles look like is is what we're aiming for at this point. Excellent, excellent. And I guess this question goes to both of you. You kind of hinted at it there. You know, when bringing, you know, it's a whole new software platform and, it, and it's a whole new, you know, a whole new autonomous shuttle and, you know, from a vehicle design to operations and all that. How, what's the best, you know, kind of best practices in terms of helping uh, you know, the the city or regional or, or other partner staff get up to speed, you know, and really get the most out of out of the product and, and the service and the device and, and, and all of it. Because it's everyone knows it's when you get jumped on here's your, you know, we're going to use this new platform, you got to learn it all over again, you know, from a workforce development standpoint, you know, how do the companies work together? And how, you know, how do you avoid burnout of every six months <laughs> having a whole new platform that can do a whole new thing? Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And I feel like there has been a lot of that burnout kind of happening over the last few years. There's been a lot of sort of fits and starts of, hey, how do we manage this and how do we get to it? Um, the, the good news is I do feel like we're at a little bit of a stasis point. Like there has been a lot of lessons learned. And if people are on this uh, webinar are, or on this conference are realizing they've never done it, um, go out and talk to your partner cities. You're welcome to talk to us. Um, th there really has been a lot of learnings over the last couple of years and i feel like there really is a, a playbook for how to do things like ask for data um, what kind of you know evaluating your capacity in-house to manage that data versus hiring a third party like a ride report um, to be able to help you with that 
Um, and obviously there's sort of the economies of scale of we, we do this in more than 70 cities around the world. So, you know, building your own data platform is very different than just um, similar to what they're saying. We're sort of turnkey where you just um, ask for the data and then the next day we're able to show you um, what's going on in your micro mobility program. Uh, so I do think that um, there, there are a lot of resources. Obviously, NACTO um, is a great guide um, on managing micro mobility. I, I encourage people to, to look at that. Um, and then Similarly, starting to talk with your potential operators early on, um, particularly ones who are showing interest. I think before you even get to the RFQ, I've seen people do RFIs um, to kind of understand what the marketplace and the interest is. Um, I think that's a, that's a good idea just to really um, understand what you want uh, before you put out permits and things like that. Um, and, and I think you can really leverage a lot of learnings in the space. Yeah, I would echo a lot of what Michael said. Um, we're, again, always open to starting the conversation really early because this is such a long process. Um, whether you have mobility priorities and budget laid out or if it's like your city is not even thinking about that yet, you know, we've talked to people at every stage. Um, and it's once once you've locked eyes on, on a mobility provider and you're going through that process, um, May, May Mobility and I think a lot of other similar providers, we, we do a lot of, of hand-holding throughout the process. It's very much, um, you know, mutually, um, just there's mutual investment there in how many people are on the project, how much time we're spending on it together, how much we're getting into the community. We make sure to, to travel there locally so that we can meet public safety, we can meet community members, um, and we really try to, to dig in, especially when it's the first launch of the city. But that said, a lot of this you can get from previous pilots. Um, the city of Columbus is, is really generous in how they're um, connecting with cities who are looking into launching AVs. So Smart Columbus has a ton of resources up on their website. They're always open to connecting with people. Um, I don't mean to uh, you know throw them under the bus and, and have everyone reach out to them, but if you go on their website, all of their data is open and there are a lot of other cities who are doing the same. So um, like Michael said, playbooks are out there. We have them, but also cities that we've worked with have them as well. Excellent, excellent. And I'll just remind everyone watching that if, you, if you'd like to um, submit a question, uh, you can use the, the box on the right to, to type in your question. We would love to hear what you guys are thinking and, and, and kind of what questions are on everyone's mind. Um, and so and I guess one other I want to talk about is, you know, for, for an MPO or for a regional council or for a COG, you know, a lot of the big focus is on long-term planning. And that is very difficult. You know, like we, we joked that the future is Wednesday, but, you know, even before COVID, there, you know, we have suddenly been getting such rapid change in a space, in a transportation, in a space that just, you know, did not see rapid change or innovation. Um, from a kind of what people are doing and all that, it was it's more of the long slog of habit change. Um, and so I'm curious what you guys think, you know, Michael, what do you think, like how can the data from micro mobility and, and the insights that are gleaned from your platform, how can that be applied or transferred to and, and become part of these longer term, you know, uh, uh, plans and the planning process? Yeah. So the the nice thing about micromobility and the data is 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 that there really is uh, now this playbook for how to share the data, uh, particularly with the permitting entities. So we have real time data coming in that creates historic data. Uh, you know, the day after it comes out, you can look at yesterday's data, see the trips, and so you're really able to see things that I think. You know, I, I worked for what was uh, called a congestion management agency in, in California, a little a mini MPO, but I know that. Uh, you know, we had a travel demand model and we used to salivate over the idea of, wow, you can understand origins and destinations of bike route, uh, of biking trips, um, routes people are taking. Um, if you put in something like slow streets, do people use them or don't they? If you have a construction project, how do people reroute? Um, so those are the kinds of insights you can get very quickly, um, which helps, of course, your travel demand model. Um, but in addition to that, if you have things like um, a call for projects and you have funding and you need to know which, which projects you're going to fund, you can understand uh, numbers around how micromobility contributes to that. Now, the thing that I will say um, that's important that probably a lot of people on this call know is that the operators have been reluctant to share data uh, with non-permitting entities. So if you're an MPO or a COG and you have a city in your region that has a micromobility program, their permits may not say that you're allowed to look at their data, particularly not the raw data. 
that's again a place where something like ride report can help because we aggregate the data to a level where it sanitizes it uh, limits the ability to de-anonymize de and identify people um, and also sort of have the idea that different views can have different level of, of access um, that said i think the best uh, programs are really where those regional entities are working with the local authorities to say hey what kind of language do we want in those permits to make sure that that data sharing is allowed to happen in a way that everybody feels comfortable with? And again, that's where sort of bringing those those parties to the table as early as possible is very helpful. Fascinating. And then, Tara, how do we get, you know, we're piloting now, and at what point do we start identifying, you know, what is the textbook? Like, this is an ideal route for using an AV shuttle to, you know, to complement and to, you know, to feed or to, you know, to benefit a, uh, broader transit system. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's what we're even trying to do today. Um, the use cases just are dependent on what the city needs. Um, we're not looking to replace, we're looking to supplement. Um, I think there are plenty of places where there's um, different use cases like a first mile, last mile solution that are needed in one pocket of the city, um, another pocket of the city where they're trying to connect to neighborhoods that don't necessarily need a full um, you know, 20 seater bus, but the micro mobility portion makes sense. Um, there's, there's just, I think, a lot of opportunities to switch from the, you know, what's happening now and allocating those resources where they're more needed and then filling in the gaps with, with our solution or with other micro mobility solutions. Um, I think that on a longer term basis, we're, we're not quite to the point yet where cities are deploying like multiple AV pilots. This is, we're very much in the early stages. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to see where we're going to start seeing um, folks who are looking to deploy these longer term and in different parts of their cities. Um, Arlington is one of those. We're actually the third um, AV route that they're deploying, which is pretty rare. Um, normally we've worked with, with you know, first movers, um, which, there aren't many vets re yet, right? So to be expected, but I'm excited to see more cities like Arlington emerge here in the, in the coming years who, who wanna really make it part of their, their ecosystem. Perfect, yeah. Well, so I, we're, I think we're coming up on time, but you know, I think one takeaway or one theme that I'm really catching from a lot of this um, is, is just the importance of communication and, and that a lot of this, you know, we are, whether it's you know COVID, whether it's public perception of shared rides in a COVID, in a pandemic, uh, whether it's micro mobility and how do we move forward and what are going to be the different roles, what is key is always communication and that we're iterating together. You know whether the public and private sector um, and third parties that there are you know that there's a lot of of different elements there, but but that it does sound like you know in a lot of of these you know you hear mostly about the kind of confrontational aspects of tech and 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 city and the public and the public sector and it's just i do love to hear you know i, I was excited to have you guys on because there are a lot of uh, great use cases and examples of companies that are like no hey like, i come from the public sector and we can take this great tech stuff and be doing the stuff that we were working on before and so uh, I, I strongly encourage anyone who's interested um, to reach out to, to Tara and to Michael. I'm happy to answer any questions too. Um, and uh, again, uh, I just wanted to, to thank Leslie, thank uh, NARC, and thank uh, thank you for joining us. All right, thank you. Thanks, everyone. This is fun. Thanks, Tara. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Pete. Uh, we are at four, so this is just a reminder that our next session is the Board of Directors discussion. Uh, and that's going to be held on a separate Zoom call. So we hope to see a lot of you there. All right. Thank you again. Thanks, everyone. Bye.